Robert Adams has uh, been in the free energy research and ether research for uh, quite a few years before there was really a free energy field online, uh, this even before the internet. Um, and he's from uh, New Zealand, and although there are a couple printed books or you know PDFs that kind of survived over time, there hasn't really been a lot of pictures or other information other than uh, maybe a handful of people who may have known him and worked with him. Um, Peter Lindemann uh, pro probably corresponded with him longer and in more depth than uh, anybody else. And he did that, I think, maybe when he was living in Santa Barbara, California years ago, possibly. And throughout all this uh, correspondence, um, there's been quite a few letters, a lot of photographs of different devices that Peter has never, or that nobody has ever really seen except uh, Peter and maybe a few of his friends. And uh, Peter's contribution to Dr. Robert Adams' work um, has been different measurement methods, but Peter never really got involved in, in, in building them. And he was heavy into the use of calorimeters to measure all the heat and, and these kind of things. And uh, Dr. Uh, Adams had, um, had various claims for, you know, d different uh, energy production amounts compared to what's going into it and kind of maybe some possible so-called cold electricity claims and, and other unusual phenomenon. And uh, so over the years, his name kind of dropped out of sight for a while, and our next presenter, I heard uh, about him actually from Simon Davies originally, who lives in um, Wales, and he's the one that does all uh, my website stuff for eMedia Press and, and helps to moderate the forums and that kind of stuff. And uh, so our, uh, Nick here was uh, kind enough to fly over from uh, straight out of Amsterdam, got here a couple days ago. And uh, yeah, long flight. And, uh, <laughs> and so his background is that uh, Nick has been a uh, software engineer and uh, entrepreneur involved with quite a few different projects. And as I mentioned, he is from Amsterdam. And he has studied uh, Tesla's, uh, the work of Tesla and a single wire transmission uh, uh, technology for quite a while. And what is your website so everybody knows? Definitely. Yeah, you know. it's, it's uh, waveguide.blog. That's my website. Blog. My, yeah, that's a new end. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Waveguide.blog, and that's also on the website, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll email everybody about that. And so anyway, Nick was kind enough to bring a uh, demonstration model here, and yeah. after the presentation, I guess we can probably put this down on the floor. Everybody well, can kind of walk we'll around. We'll, we'll or maybe over, over there against yeah. uh, that table over there. So anyway, please help welcome uh, Nick Crockman. Hi, guys. So why should you care about this machine? Um, well, this is Robert Adams, and he said this machine is able to demonstrate excess power delivery, so more um, mechanical or electrical output than you put in through the power supply. Um, and he said there is potential for harnessing energy supply to the air gap uh, from the zero point field or the ether. Um, this is the wording he used in his, uh, his UK patent. So that's already quite interesting, but like I said, this was only the first stage of his development. His later machines actually ran up to the megawatt range. Uh, and that is really crazy stuff. And so I'm really excited to tell you about this. So we already saw that uh, Adams made the claim that his device um, yeah, uh, shows excess energy. Um, but there are more bold claims that he made. So let's uh, go into those very quickly. He said, there's uh, hardly any lens drag experienced uh, in the motor because of the way it is, uh, it is pulsed. Uh, there's hardly any hysteresis because there's no reversal of current going on because it's, uh, it's a DC device and uh, also hardly any eddy currents. And this allows the motor to stay cool. And with cool he meant, um, I know we're in the States and you use Fahrenheit, but uh, he meant that uh, the motor under full load so a full load put on the motor running for a long time wouldn't heat up above 20 degrees Celsius above ambient. Uh, so you would need no active cooling of this device. Um, for example, I have one single transistor here and it's on a small heat sink, but the only reason it's on the heat sink is because that made it easier for me to mount it. Uh, I could take the heat sink off and it would run under full load and it, you could just touch the transistor and it doesn't heat up. This is his system that he invented to, uh, to control the duty cycle and the timing of the, of the pulses to the motor because that is incredibly important to achieve the uh, right 
results and to achieve the efficiency that you, that you want. So you see that if um, he had uh, spring contacts, so spring contacts on top of this, this disk, and if you place the contact here, you would have a 50% duty cycle, the mark to space uh, ratio, and 25% um, if you put it all the way at the tip. So that is, uh, was helpful and if you just twisted it on the shaft, uh, you would get a different uh, starting point of your pulse. So that was his, uh, his way to do it. Uh, of course, um, no one listens to what he actually says and just starts using transistors. I did too. I even started using an Arduino on top of that. Of course, he definitely wasn't using an Arduino back then. So um, he actually says, if you're not using this mechanical switch, you won't see the same results and you also lose the battery charging uh, effect. And that is very interesting to me because I see, of course, a lot of, um, yeah, the Bedini circuits, for example, where people try to, to capture the, the, the collapsing magnetic field and then try to return it to the battery and, su and such. And there's definitely something to it, but apparently by using a simple mechanical switch, it somehow takes care of that it's, uh, on its own. So that's why he felt that temperature was telling you much more than your, than your average multimeter. So this is, these are some of the pictures that uh, Peter received from, uh, from Adams and they show his, um, his calorimetry devices. He spent years perfecting these, just trying to measure the heat energy almost that was going in and the heat energy that was coming out. Now, where uh, I want to go a little bit into uh, where uh, this free en oops, where this free energy, uh, so to speak, was coming from. You know, because he says my device generates excess energy. Now, where is that energy coming from? So, this is a simplified view. Obviously, this is uh, supposed to be the rotor with a magnet in it. You have the drive coil with a uh, soft iron core, and you have about a 1.25 millimeter air gap in between. Um, which, um, in, so what is happening is the rotor magnet is attracted to the stator core, the iron core. That is free. Next, we need only a tiny amount of current to demagnetize the core. When that happens, the rotor is free to continue spinning. And he says, briefly, I would mention that uh, for perfection in the sciences of electromagnetics, that one must follow the order of the Great Pyramid that all design must involve harmonics, phi, exponent pi, Brown's constant, and the Fibonacci series. For example, Adams says to use a 72 ohm drive coil if we're using 120 volts. That means you're using a stronger magnet as well. Um, 72 seems pretty, you know, specific. So what could that be? Could that have to do with any of this sacred geometry? And I wanted to just end the presentation with this quote that I really enjoyed when I first read about it. A man about 46 years of age, given the name of Joshua Coppersmith, has been arrested in New York for attempting to extort funds from ignorant and superstitious people by exhibiting a device which he says will convey the human voice over any distance over metallic wires so that it can be heard by the listener at the other end. He calls this instrument a telephone. Well-informed people know that it is impossible to transmit a human voice over wires. <laughs> Thank you very much.